Hey family, and welcome to the Critical Sense Making Session facilitated by yours truly, Revolutionary Rika. Today is episode 18. Today's topic is spatial culture. Today's guest is Dr. Mari Gray. She is an Oakland native who is passionate about finding joy, goodness, and purpose in every life's lesson, raising young black men who experience love and joy and have gorgeous character, and continuing to learn and grow every day. Dr. Gray, tell us a little bit more about who you are and choose one word to describe how you're showing up. Oh man, who am I? Um, I think the, the thing that most defines me is that I'm a mom and um, I'm a momademic. <laughs> I've heard people say that before. Uh, and um, I'm just trying to find ways to balance my two identities. There aren't lots of academics who have so many children. I have four um, in the academy. So, um, and I have really little kids, you know, seven um, and through age 20. Um, so that's kind of who I am and what I'm, I'm working with these days. And then your second question was? To choose one word to describe how you're showing up. I am showing up today reflective. I had a really rich conversation with a sister friend earlier today, and I'm still kind of chewing on that. Awesome. Well, thank you for again um, agreeing to be on the podcast. And we're going to jump right into our icebreaker question. And that is what has been your guilty pleasure during the pandemic? Oh, I have so many, child. Look. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't feel guilty about them. Um, well, I watch trash TV sometimes. <laughs> Stuff I wouldn't want to share. Stuff I'm embarrassed about. So that's maybe the one thing. Um, a guilty pleasure, let me think. I think, I, I mean, I've loved um, waking up late. I've loved being able to kind of move my day around. Um, what works for me best. Um, and then, so that's like a guilty pleasure. I would, haven't been telling people like, I might not wake up until 10. Um, and I might go to bed at four. Um, I love tea and cups of good cups of coffee and a good glass of port. Um, I love a good cup, a, a good slice of sourdough bread toasted. I mean, these are kind of ridiculous things, but um, I watch the Real Housewives, like all the black shows. That's, yeah. you know, that's, I'm watching all the black people, um, especially black women on TV. Mm -hmm. So yeah, <laughs> a lot of that. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, giving us some tips on what we can actually um, do while we're stuck on a pandemic. So I'm gonna move us into our first set of questions. And the first one is, tell us a little bit about life growing up in Oakland. Okay, growing up in Oakland. I wanna say that I think a lot of people have misconceptions about Oakland, what it is. And, and so I grew up in Oakland starting in 72. So that's the year I'm, I'm born. And I lived in Oakland until um, 94, let me think 90 when I went off to college. And then again, when I came home because I couldn't afford <laughs> to live on my own for a while. So growing up in Oakland, um, so I came of age during um, key moments in time in black history. So I'm born in 72 in a family that is um, in the nation of Islam. So I have an African name, Mariama. All of my cousins have African names. Uh, my mother wasn't a Muslim, but my uncle, uh, my grandfather. Um, and so this was something that really influenced me when I think about like early childhood memories of what did I see on the walls? I remember going to my uncle's house um, in Oakland and he had a picture of um, what we called then the Honorable Elijah Muhammad or who we called um, on his wall and you know what people wore. Um, and then I also grew up um, during a time of black revolutionary. So I wasn't even like super aware of what was happening because people weren't like saying things like the elders weren't saying things but it was just kind of in the ether so i'm growing up in the 70s at the end of the time of the black panther party or maybe in the middle but it's it's um 
it's around me, right? And so um, I, I see on the walls, like I have all these glimpses of, um, you know, posters that say free Mumia and just like stuff like that, like that just, and I remember thinking, who is Mumia, you know? Um, and so I watched a movie on, about him later on. I was like, oh my God, this, this guy is, is powerful. Um, I grew up in a time where there are black leaders in all areas of my life, right? So my high school, my teachers are black, you know, and smart black folk, you know, um, who push us. Um, in elementary school, um, I didn't have any black teachers. I don't remember, I remember one, one black elementary school teacher. But by the time I get to seventh grade, I have Mrs. Allen, who's a black uh, math teacher and she's just powerful. She's like strict, um, but super professional and super like uh, into pushing us toward being the best that we can be academically. And so I'm, I'm like in the lineage of these beautiful black women who push me. And then um, I go to high school and um, I have a black Spanish teacher in, um, in middle school too, I did. But in high school, my ninth grade year, I went to private school and I have this black middle school, black male um, teacher. And it's important because I'm now in this, I moved from public school to um, private school, which is a mostly white and Asian space. But I have this one black Spanish teacher who is just like, I kind of glom onto him in my heart. Um, and then I leave that school because it's just really um, uncomfortable for me. It's uh, class-wise, I'm not in the same economic class as the rest of the school at all. And they kind of make it known to me. Um, and I, and even though there are other black girls, they make it known to me too, um, that I'm not one of them. And so uh, 10th through 12th grade, I go to a smaller school and I have these amazing black teachers, some good, some, some better than others, but definitely a space where all the people are there intentionally, a black, um, counselor, Mrs. Bobineau, a black principal. I think her first name was like Cheryl or something. I can't remember, but I remember hearing her name and she was young. Um, and I thought she was smart and pretty and all this. And, um, and so I have these black teachers and black principal and black uh, counselor. And then my superintendent is, I thought at the time was a black man, I learned he isn't, but he felt moved like one to me my mayor is a black man, my city manager is a black man. Willie Brown is the speaker of the assembly. And so I'm just surrounded by black excellence, right? Um, so, you know, my mayor is Ellie Hugh Harris and my father is kind of politically active. Um, so he kind of um, makes, makes me aware of like what's going on politically at the time. And so I'm paying attention. I'm sitting on, um, I'm president of my class, my junior and senior year. Um, and so my vice principal, who's my boyfriend at the time is also, is also a black guy, right? And so we're on these, um, this panel where we get to be with the city of um, Oakland Unified, where we get to help select the next, um, the incoming um, superintendent. And so there's a lot of uh, like kind of academic privilege that's happening um, in my life. Like, so all the time I'm in school in Oakland, I'm treated very well, like I'm smart, like I'm capable and given all these like kind of rich and high status academic opportunities. But also growing up in Oakland, I, um, so there's black excellence and black power. And I see all these amazing black people around me. And for me, Oakland's like the Mecca, like people refer to Atlanta as the Mecca or Howard as the Mecca. For me, I'm in the Mecca, right? But I also watch my city um, crumble during the crack epidemic, right? I see the war on drugs up close and personal. Um, so it's a city that's kind of divided along class lines, um, lines of neighborhood um, where you live, you know, flatlands versus the hills. So I grew up in the Oakland Hills. And so I'm pretty much sheltered from a lot of things except that I'm related to people who live in the flatlands and are having a different experience. Um, so while I'm getting an amazing opportunity in education, I watch my cousins who are the same age as me not get the same academic opportunities and have the same experiences. So they're dropping out of high school, they're having their first babies, they're hustling to help their mothers put food on the table. And I'm getting kind of pushed through these um, un uh, special opportunities. So that's what it for me felt like growing up an opportunity, watching these like parallel universes 
of like what happens to black kids. Ooh, thank you, thank you for sharing that. So what is spatial culture? Yeah, spatial culture is a lot of what I see happening in Oakland, right? So when I talk about spatial culture, I'm talking about the norms, the practices, the beliefs that impact the ways that folks interact within a space. So, and you know, every space has culture. So um, you think about the black church, the black church, like the Baptist church. Grandfather, um, sorry, my great grandfather is a Baptist minister, right? And so there are spatial culture, there's a spatial culture at his church. So, you know, when you're supposed to stand up, when you're supposed to sit down, when you're supposed to sing what hymn, um, I'll never forget some of those hymns, um, uh, you know, that you're not supposed to talk. So the lady next to me um, is always passing me candy, you know, to keep my mouth shut, um, which is, you know, how you're supposed to pass the plate down the aisle, um, when you can get up, when you can't get up, what you're supposed to wear and what you're not supposed to wear, the kinds of music you sing or don't. And all of this is part of spatial culture. It's like, it governs our interactions. It governs um, uh, relationships um, within a space. And so spatial culture is pretty much everywhere and it defines how we live and interact. So thinking back on your childhood, you did mention some of it, but how are you um, affected by spatial culture? So to understand how I'm impacted by spatial culture, you have to go back a couple of generations, right? I think my, the way I'm impacted by spatial culture is the way that my ancestors are impacted. So I, I started off telling you about these high status educational opportunities, but I didn't tell you why they happen. And that's because of my mother. So my mother um, is a black woman who grows up in the fifties and sixties um, and is really, she grows up and she tells me a lot um, about her educational experiences and how anti-black they were for her how as a chocolate white, as a chocolate black woman, she was treated um, by other black teachers because you know, in, in that time we still had black teachers um, teaching black children, even though she grows up on the West Coast. Um, and so she, she tells me about these kind of anti-black experiences she has within education and also how a lot of her educational opportunity is foreclosed um, for her and how, how um, she is not, uh, given the best op educational opportunities. So she's not taught things and, and it just, it is what it is for her. Um, and she knows that she could do better. Um, and so when she has her first child, who's me, she works to ensure that educational opportunities are not foreclosed for me. She moves, um, she moves me from school to school. And when the classroom um, spaces for me are anti-Black, she steps in. And she says, you know, like, you will not do this to my child. So, um, so one of the earliest, you know, there are lots of ways I'm impacted by anti-Blackness in the spatial culture. But one of the ways that she tells me, a story she tells me often is um, being in early elementary. It has to be like sometime around second or third grade, um, probably second grade. And I'm probably ahead of my class a little bit academically. And um, the teacher makes me, um, tutor white kids who aren't understanding things in class. And when my mother finds out about this, because she's asking me about asking me something about my education and she finds out about this, she's angry. And she goes to the school and she tells him that my job is not to tutor the white kids who are going to, um, who society is going to promote ahead of me, but it's to extend her, their job is to extend my learning and provide me with the kind of educational opportunity that I'm supposed to have. And so she gets me out of this kind of experience where I'm made to play it small and to be, um, to be deferential to the white kids in my classroom. And she pushes the teachers to recognize my humanity. Um, and so that's one of the first, like I, I learned this later, but um, I'm definitely keenly aware that in some of the schools that I am the only black kid in the room and that the culture isn't something that I'm familiar with. Like they, they celebrate, um, I went to school at one point in Piedmont and the school is um, culturally, I'm not sure uh, how many Jewish kids there were, but I knew, I grew up celebrating like Hanukkah um, in school. 
in, in knowing all the words to the dreidel song, right? So the spatial culture is one that's um, celebrating Jewish, her Jewish heritage. And, um, and I don't grow up as a kid in that school hearing anything about black history, you know? Um, and, and that actually happens all throughout elementary school. Nothing ever teaches me about my blackness. Um, and so it's something I have to learn separately. And my dad, I remember a time when I'm little and my dad, I must be third grade because my dad takes me to some kind of event and, and then it's at a school and it might be in East Palo Alto, but I know that wearing daishikis. I remember that wearing a daishiki and it being like kind of foreign to me. And then I remember um, people speaking Swahili, like that, like actively being taught Swahili. And so there's, this other spatial culture that's one of pride, right? That's like recognition of my blackness. Um, and so that's something that stays with me, um, even though I don't always understand what's happening because there's not a lot of explanation being given to me. Things are, I'm just being moved and, sh and, and, and shifted from one place to the next. And I, I later kind of put it all together and go, oh, my parents were trying to do this, or they tried to do this thing for me, um, to give me a sense of identity, to give me a sense of history, to give me a sense of, to give me an educational opportunity. And they weren't always explaining every step along the way to me. But um, spatial culture, for me, the spatial culture that I, I was in were spaces where um, teachers would sometimes try to, um, to remove opportunities for me. And my mother was smart enough to recognize and to push, and to push back on them and to go to school um, to go to bat for me. Um, as a student of color, how were you impacted by carcerality? Oh, wow. So carcerality, if I were to define it, it's um, related to imprisonment or incarceration. And um, so this is a sad story, right? My first experience with carcerality likely has nothing to do with me being a student of color and likely has everything to do with um, what happens to my dad um, after the Vietnam War. So my dad's a Vietnam veteran and, um, and lived with PTSD for a very long time. So although carcerality impacted me as a young kid, I don't recognize, I, I was oblivious to it and I didn't recognize it for a long time. So one of my earliest memories of, of carcerality is actually me calling the police on my dad because my dad um, had fought my mom and I think it was, you know, knowing that my dad, my dad's an abusive man, um, knowing that he fought her as a kid. I think at some point I remember in my mind making the decision and I, again, I'm little like seven, eight, um, thinking about like, he's hurting my mom, what do I do? And I call the police. And so this is um, like my very earliest memory of, of how, um, uh, penality and punishment and carcerality all, all become a part of my life. So I don't know if my father goes to jail or what happens to him afterward, but I remember we lived in, um, at a house, in a house that was, um, there's the hill and then you have to walk down some steps to get to my house. So I remember, and the, the street is flat. And so on the street, there's the police officer and my dad. And I remember going up you know, to the level where the police officer and my dad are, um, and then going back down, you know, I just have glimpses. Um, and so when you've gone through that kind of trauma, you don't remember every single little detail, but that's the earliest member, memory I have of carcerality is, ju is just involving my dad. And this is the first time I've ever told anybody this story, but I think it's super important, right? To like start to tell the truth about our relationship with carcerality. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then growing up in Oakland, I was aware of the rumors of the Oakland PD and definitely of what's happening with the, the crack epidemic, right? Um, but I didn't think much about um, racialization and carcerality or the ways that the, that the carcerality of the state is weaponized to protect whiteness for a long time, right? I didn't put two and two together and they're not talking about it really in my home at all. Like my mom, uh, is pretty mute even to this day um, about uh, about race. She doesn't really say a lot. 
about race, um, about policing, um, it just wasn't something that she even had a lot of language for. So carcerality um, comes to mean something to me much later in my life than, than maybe for other people whose family are actively talking about it um, because I think my family is trying to protect me from even having to recognize that it can be part of my life um, or that it impacts black people. There's this kind of super protection that's going on in my, in my home. Um, so carcerality comes to mean something different to me um, around the time I'm in college. So um, I go to college at Stanford and at that point, um, I don't remember what year it is, um, but I'm not a freshman, I don't believe. And Rodney King is beaten, um, brutalized by the police. And we all watch it on TV, we're in dorms and where all the black people are, all the black students are like talking about this and we decide to march. Um, and so we march um, down, you know, across the campus, down University Avenue into this pretty white space of Palo Alto, right? And the campus is pretty white. And I'm keenly aware of like me being a black person in this space and it being like, being like almost transgressive, you know? Um, but I'm transgressing against the like normalization of, of penality, of the carcerality of, um, of not even carcerality at this point, because he's not even, you know, well, he's in jail, but like the normalization of like being able to brutalize black men and black people by extension, right? Um, and so I'm starting to, to like this awakening is starting to happen where, you know, my family's been hush hush about it. They don't want me to be bothered. And as a black woman growing up in the Oakland Hills, I'm sheltered um, and I don't really have language to talk about the carceral state the hyper surveillance of black people, the disproportionality of police stops and incarcerations. I have, I have no experience with policing in my life um, all the way through you know, my undergraduate time. Um, so my understanding of carcerality has been a work in progress. So, so it's a growing awareness over time. Um, and it still is, you know, because it's not personal to me yet. So, I could tell you a little bit more about like, more about carcerality. You want, you want to hear a little bit more about how I started to think about it? So, so remember I'm 21, I graduate high school. I'm in this hyper like, um, like elite space. Um, I become a teacher um, at a private school and then at a public school. And I'm walking down like a couple of times, carcerality comes home to me, you know, or at least policing. Maybe I won't call it always carcerality, but policing comes home. And with it, the, the idea that I could be incarcerated, right? So I'm driving my car. Um, uh, I think it's not even my car. It's probably my aunt's car because I don't get a, my, a car until much later. So I'm driving my aunt's car around campus and I am stopped by the police. And they, they pull me over. And I am just like, like all kind of super elite people who are completely oblivious. I'm like, why are you pulling me over? Like I have a major attitude. And they're like, well, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I scoff really. And I'm like, I am a student here and I'm arrogant. And I never think about like later on, I think like, girl, you could have been incarcerated. They would get a carriage your little butt off and you could have been the next statistic. But, and I'm just like, here's my, you know, and he asked me all these questions and I'm just like playing the Stanford card, right? So, I, you know, and that's when they're like, so this is place of privilege I have, right? Like I have a license and I have a Stanford ID and don't you see that? And don't, you, and, and you need to move along officer because you work for me. I very much had that attitude at the time. Later I leave the campus, I'm, I'm out of school and I'm walking along the street with my brother who is a young black man. He's like a teenager, barely. He's my baby brother, five years younger than me. My mom works in Mountain View at the time. And so we've moved from Oakland to Mountain View and she's a, a beautician. And my sister, brother and I are all walking down the street and um, we get stopped by the police, like walking on the street. And they ask us what we're doing there. And like, it's such a crazy question to me. I've, I've never been stopped, right? And so I'm like, I'm walking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they asked me all these questions. I'm like, my mom works at the salon, but they, the way that they treat my brother, well, I'll never forget. He's like a baby, you know, he has no clue. 
and the way that they kind of, and, and I'm powerless at this point, you know? So I don't, I don't know how many more times he's treated like that in his life, but I'm, I'm certain it's a lot. But witnessing how they treat my brother is something that like um, sticks with me, you know, because it definitely is kind of a gendered violence, right? It's a, even though now I know much more about how, how poorly black women are treated by police, at the time in my 20s, I'm much more concerned with black men and the police. And so um, I, I begin to become aware of like what police do to black people and particularly black men. And so as a teacher, um, so I graduate and as a teacher, you know, I'm in the community working. Um, I try to handle every complaint, con you know, conflict in my own classroom. So I actively avoid involving my students in the school to prison nexus. And it's not a major thought to me about the real nexus of it, but I just know that they don't need to go to the office, right? Like it doesn't need to get any bigger than between you and me. And so we handle that. Um, and I'm profoundly implicated in carcerality later on in my career. So I moved from, become, from working as a teacher where I'm handling all of my own discipline, any conflict, it never gets beyond like, can you take a step outside and let's talk about this. And I have these, what I think are fantastic relationships with kids. And then I go to work at a high school as a vice principal. And then it's different because now I'm handling everybody else's poor relationships with students. Like they have none. They don't like kids, right? And that's when like I have a school resource officer and I have rules that I'm supposed to follow, right? Like, so this and this equals suspension. This and this, you have to call the police. And so now I have to involve the police. So you got, you know, we've searched you and that's a form of, you know, that's a form of carcerality, right? The idea that we can frisk you and search your body or search your person or, or search your belongings. And so even if they're not using them, but somebody thinks that somebody's got some kind of drug. And so, um, so I'm the person that they call now and I become the person that has to move kids of color because I'm at a school that's mostly kids of color, um, have to, have to, call the school resource officer, I have to suspend students. And it's just, it's hitting me, right? Like, so my first year, I, I just can't even believe that, that so much discipline happens. Um, and I'm so like, I think that they're crazy. The teachers are like crazy. Like, why are you sending him up for a pencil, for paper? Why don't you like them? Why are you in education? Uh, and I start to realize what school is for a lot of kids. And so then we start, you know, I start brokering deals with students and I start having to deal with teachers who don't think I'm doing enough. Um, and, and it's a lot, right? And so my last year in administration, in school administration is 2010. Um, and I have a student, I, by then I've applied to grad school um, at Davis. And I have a student who, um, is in foster care and I spend a year getting to know him. It's a black boy. And we have a good relationship. He's like blowing out of classrooms because he's in foster care and he did, and he's, he just, there's so much emotional stuff that lands, a, that a kid in foster care is dealing with. And he's got um, a white foster care mother who cares about him, but she doesn't know how to help him. And so he blows up one day, I'm home. I'm not at work that day. He blows up. And up until that point, I've always been able to kind of intervene, but I'm not there. And so he gets in trouble and he gets in like big trouble where like he uh, gets in trouble, the, off, the school resource officer's call, puts him in the back of his car uh, with handcuffs, you know, and the kid kicks out his window. Oh, it's on, it's on. So he gets suspended. Um, he gets, uh, um, what's the word, arrested. And he is removed from his foster home. And they asked me to make an impact statement. So I go, I write my statement up. I don't even remember what it says. So I go to the court to give my impact statement. 
and I'm incredibly nervous and there's really nobody to advise me in my whole district. Um, and maybe I don't seek it like I should either, but I go um, and I think I'm gonna get there and I'm gonna see him and get a chance to talk to him and then read my statement. And you wanna talk about being powerless? The criminal justice system, even when it's for the juveniles, juvenile justice system, it makes everybody powerless. You don't know the rules. Um, you don't know how to effectively advocate. They don't really care what you think. They, it's kind of transactional space where they want you to do a thing and only what they've asked you to do and you can't do anything different or more. Um, and so it's just really humiliating for me. And I can't imagine how it is for the young man um, who is most assuredly an adult right now. Um, and I think I leave this space feeling like um, powerless. And I see how these spaces destroy young adults, trust in adults, right? And any sense of fairness, right? Because at the end of the day, he is a victim. He is a child that's removed from his home because something happened with his parent. He's put in home after home. He's ripped from the home that he's in and likely not getting very good mental health care and not in a like culturally relevant home context either, but whatever they can put him in. And I know the teacher he was blowing up with was just kind of this very punitive personality. That's why I was intervening so much. And I didn't have the skill set to kind of really lay it on the line for him. Like this is this is what the baby's dealing with. And this is how we need to work differently for, with him. I wasn't brave enough even to effectively advocate. So that's like the big way I became aware of carcerality is like through working with adjudicated youth in my school, right? It's interesting you mentioned that because I know a lot of times for the students I've worked with, um, many of them are triggered by their teachers. And so something that may have started off as small as me sucking my teeth when I came in, because I'm tired and I really don't want to say something, but you're, you're kind of calling me out, has now turned into this blown up situation or whatever. And with each adult, I'm being re-traumatized over and over again because they think I won't listen. I was... Um, I just presented in Dr. Lopez's class and we were talking about, um, um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, we were talking about young people and how teachers bring their own biases sometimes from experiences that they've had with other black girls or boys or whoever the person is that they're working with. And they project those things onto those young people and the young people don't have the language. They don't have the strategies or the tools to actually respond, so they react. And then you send them to someone else and then they're expecting them to, um, to shape up and get it together when we have to like work with the biology and not against it, right? And so until they get to a space, giving them 15 minutes to calm down before you even talk about what actually was going on. So when I hear you talk about, we share this story thinking about if somebody would have given him that 15, 20 minutes to calm down, then he would have been able to, you know, um, speak to what actually happened, how he's feeling, what actually triggered him, um, and then we can get somewhere. But because I'm going to use uh, Monique's word, we move at the speed of whiteness, we need to just get back to the lesson, your feelings or um, what's going on with you doesn't matter at this point. So That's um, right. We had so many teachers who didn't know how to build relationships and were so scared of kids. And they felt like they were giving them such a big gift by being somewhat patient. You know, if, if a kid shows up repeatedly in the same way, there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's, you're not gifting them. You're, you know, by, by being patient and by checking in with them. You know, I really feel like it's your job as an educator. That was how I felt like my job was. My job was to deal with who was put before me. Um, and it really hurt me to see so many of my colleagues have very little patience for anything that was even mildly, because it wasn't like the kid was throwing stuff across the room or anything. It was just like, maybe he wasn't focused for a minute. And and he just wasn't having it. I, I, I often felt like he was under a microscope. So he was just kind of waiting for him to mess up anyway. So 
we kind of responded to the next set of questions already, but I wanted to know in general, um, what impact do you feel like um, spatial culture or um, carcerality have on your students? Yeah, um, I mean, it's one where students are often asked to behave a certain way. Um, and for them, for most students, it's fine. You know, most students know how to align themselves with the standard for each and every classroom. But I think that a lot of students felt like they couldn't be their authentic selves and um, they felt invisibilized and erased. Um, they didn't feel like teachers cared about them or that they mattered. So I think when I write about spatial culture and I talk about spatial culture, I, I talk about centering um, particular kinds of voices and being aware, you know, of these voices, because now I'm in a space where I can prepare other educators, right? Um, and so in that work, I think about what I was seeing in my classroom and in other classrooms. So in, with my own students, right, when I was a teacher, um, I taught English language development. Um, and and what they were experiencing were teachers who didn't necessarily want to teach them, who didn't believe very much in them. And not, not every teacher, but enough of them where they, kids know. So kids knew that, you know, people had low standards for them, they didn't expect much of them. Um, they thought they were bad. That was a lot of what I, I would hear. Like when I, I taught the intermediate class for the English language development department. So they were not newcomers and they weren't the most advanced. Uh, sorry, I taught the most advanced class. So they were, they had moved through the ranks. So they had um, had two years of education and then I taught the third class. And it was the class that was just before they were put in what we called at the time, Sadai or sheltered English. And then then depending, we would maybe move them to mainstream English. It was, so it was like kind of a segregated program. Not best practice anymore, but that's what we had at the time. And so the students would come that, that were in my class, every year they kind of give report, like, okay, so you're getting this class. They would tell you, oh, these kids. And so, and I stopped wanting to hear about like what people thought about these kids because I, you could hear the biases, right? Like, so these, you know, they're this, they're that. And, and I remember it just, I wasn't having the same experiences. So I thought maybe something was wrong with me, but it was just, I was a different person and I had different expectations and relationships with students. So that was it really. Um, so in terms of spatial culture, like what they were, what I was seeing was like these, again, low standards, um, not a lot of like, um, a lot of stereotypes about who students were, particularly boys of color, um, and particularly Latino students. I mean, unfortunately I saw, saw a lot of like, anti-Latinidad, which is anti-Latino sentiment. Um, and, you know, maybe privileging of certain kids who are like more mi middle-class behaving or performing um, or white kids, you know, especially if they were European students from, you know, students who are from Europe and were learning English. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of sad. So how do schools regularly reproduce carceral logics by establishing and employing spatial practices rooted in white supremacy? Um, well, I think one of the first ways they do that is by creating these kind of low status and high status classes uh, and spaces like these tracks. Um, Jeannie Oaks writes about this, but then you can see, you see it too in um, Anne uh, Ferguson's book, um, Black, Black Boys. Um, I think it's bad boys or something. Anyway, and um, Ferguson writes about black boys and um, the carceral logics underpinning schools. So these, we create certain kinds of spaces. So we create punishment spaces like in school suspension rooms or, um, uh, you know, holding rooms. Um, then we have these, uh, you know, high status spaces that you can only get into if you have done certain kinds of things. So like, you know, all the rooms should be completely integrated. Every classroom should be a mix of whoever you have at the school, but you have these like mostly white spaces and they're high status spaces and they're capital rich spaces. Um, so like you have AP and honors um, and that, that becomes like the, the consequence of adult behavior and beliefs about kids, right? So these kids 
can go to this space because they behave, they um, are likely to be smarter, um, they exhibit these forms of capital that we value. And these kids, they're probably not so smart. And they're of course, students of color, students with disabilities, students who are immigrants, students who speak um, multiple languages. And so these kids are, um, and the language is often low status, like Spanish. Like if you're a French speaker, you're gonna go to that high status space. But if you're like the Spanish speaker from Mexico, not from Spain, but Mexico, you're probably gonna go to this space, this low status space. So I think that's one of the ways that we reproduce these carceral logics in, in, in white supremacy in schools, right? So, um, and the carcerality of it comes out of like the kinds of education you get. And then what happens when you get a low quality education, kids act out, right? Um, and you get low quality teachers um, who have very low expectations and, and low patience and very little skill and, um, patient, you know, desire to teach particular students. And so the kids might respond to that teacher. And instead of the teacher being the adult and kind of um, working with the student, they often send them out. And so you see these kids full, the, the in-school suspension room full of kids of color. Um, and you don't see, and, and then even in the classrooms where they may be a, a just a, a regular classroom. So maybe you have a school that's kind of flat. Um, you notice what teachers what they notice. So in, in my research, I, I have data on teaching teacher noticing patterns and there's a big amount of, so a rich body of literature that looks at teacher noticing patterns. So who teachers notice, right? So they notice, you know, if you've got two kids doing the same thing, they're gonna notice the kid of color more likely. And that's like carcerality in the classroom, right? Um, and, and so it just, it's reproduced there. There's like carcerality, white supremacy, all in the classroom because the teacher is, you know, disproportionately often noticing kids of color, boys, um, and not noticing. So my research shows how little they notice white students and particularly female white students, right? Um, and then middle class, female, and white students. And, and the research I do, they actually provide students with alibis. So you see two students out, a Latino boy, and a white girl. And the Latino boy, they ask, where are you going? The white girl, they say, are you going to such and such, like the bathroom or something like that? And so they supply her with an alibi. All she has to say is yes. Even if she's on the way to her car and look, my research shows her, me, I was at the site for three years, so I knew the pathways. She looked like she was under her car, going to her car, right? She, the bathroom was behind us. Are you going to the, to the bathroom? Yeah. And so she turns around to go toward the bathroom. And so she never gets in trouble. And the Latino boy, the boy of color, he's asked where he's going. So he's like hyper surveilled. And she's, you know, the fact that she's noticed is a bonus because sometimes the kids aren't, the white kids aren't even noticed in my research, you know? So um, patterns of noticing the ways that, that the kinds of questions they ask students or the expectations they have of them are all the ways of like spatial white supremacy happening in schools. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I was um, been reading, I went to the Justice for Every Black Girls conference. And one of the young ladies um, that there were about eight young ladies that uh, facilitated the morning session, which they were between the ages of 12 and 18 from across the United States. They were a really powerful group. And one of them pointed out that um, how she is, you know, criminalized or adultified when she's in school. And similar to what you were talking about, she could have on the same outfit as a, someone of another ethnicity. And because black girls feel out much faster, um, um, they're more curvy, they look more adult like in some instances, they get treated and criminalized for that when somebody could walk with the same outfit and they'd say hello and the person would keep walking and wouldn't even mention anything. And so um, you highlighting that just really um, drove home the point that she made that we actually have to let our children be children because they are feeling, um, they are feeling the pressure of trying to be, be seen as adults, but not giving grace to make mistakes as other kids are. So that's what just came up for me as you were talking. Yeah, and I, I mean, I remember being the vice principal of a school and like being hyper-focused on like clothing, like the girls' clothing. And they would often say something to me about the boys' clothing. 
And I realized that we have very gendered expectations. Um, we police women's bodies um, in ways that we don't police boys' bodies or in, or in different ways, right? So they can't wear anything that kind of shows what we perceive to be as, um, you know, a sexual organ, right? So their breasts, they can't wear low cut anything or they can't wear short things that maybe, you know, just un skimpy things. And we're so afraid of girls um, looking that way. And it has really nothing to do with how they would perform in the classroom. And then we say, well, the reason why is because, you know, boys might be distracted. <laughs> you know? and, and the girl's like, I'm putting on clothes, his clothes don't distract me. So are you gonna tell him the same thing? Like, you know, he can't wear this. These, the school rule is because I can't be, dis, you know, he, he might be distracting to me. We just, we have a double standard for girls and for boys. Um, and, and unfortunately, I mean, I made a lot of mistakes as a vice principal about how I spoke to kids about um, clothing and behavior. Uh, and all of it was kind of rooted in this carceral state, you know, of getting kids to behave um, and conform in particular ways. It was like the carceral, patriarchal, uh, white supremacist, neoliberal state. I mean, I think that's a lot of isms, but um, they were all related um, in this kind of conformity, like producing this particular kind of body um, and that we wanted to, to um, to do this particular kind of a thing. Um, and, it, and it had nothing to do with education. Well, the, one of the young ladies also mentioned that they, most black girls are not able to feel comfortable in their own bodies and that's in society or at home because many times they'll tell them at home, um, go put on some clothes cause he's here. And it may not be that she just may have on some shorts and a t-shirt. And she's like, as a kid, why am I responsible for how an old per uh, an older person is responding to me? And so it just um, it what you're talking about for me is just really connecting the dots in that area, um, and just want to know how we could um, counter it so that young ladies start to feel comfortable. You're making me think about a book. I'm trying to think of the name, the author's name. Tressie McMillan Cotton wrote a book. And I'm since I have my computer up, I'm going to look at it. Because I used to be able to tell you the name of the book um, immediately. It's called Thick and Other Essays. Um, and what I love about this book is that um, she begins to talk about the sexualization of Black girls, right? So, I mean, I don't remember how young I was. Um, but I was pretty young um, before my mother started to kind of, I don't think she ever did to me what some people do to their daughters, which is, oh, cover up because he's here. But she was always aware of the ways that men could take, try to take advantage of me. And so again, my mother was very protective of me um, and so I, she never shamed me. And I, I just, I should probably thank her for a lot of the things that she did. I need to tell her that when I see her on Zoom on Thanksgiving, you know, but um, she was definitely aware of um, assault, sexual assault of young women. And in Thick, Tracy McMillan Cottom talks about that, right? The adultification of black girls in this particular way by, by um, black men in the family or that are friends of the family, right? So we often, you know, I think for black women, there's kind of no, we're always being adultified by men, whether it's black men in the family or friends or in the community. So you can walk down the street and he can be like, girl, you shaking that thing and you're 13 and you're not trying to shake anything. You're just trying to walk to the store with your friends and maybe you're wearing shorts and maybe he thinks they they look a certain way on you. And Pookie is really just um, a pedophile, right? Um, and, and then there, you know, so there's that, like the, the pedophiles in your proximity, right? Um, and then there is, and this is a story I don't think we talk about nearly enough in Black America, um, that like, I'm a chocolate Black woman, but my great-grandmothers are 
on the census as mulattoes, right? And so how does that happen? That happens through rape, right? And so nobody ever talks about it in my family, especially on my dad's side. But I look at these pictures and I look at these women and the dignity they had, but they're the product, they're children and they are the product of rape. Um, and so we don't talk about how um, white men have raped black women for hundreds of years. Um, and my husband and I were just talking about this uh, just the other night, um, how, uh, black women in the, even in the 60s. And you see this in books that really talk about what really is going on. So when black women are in, it's working as maids and servants in homes. So not just the 60s, but you know, that whole time period where women whisper to their daughters and teach their daughters to be very careful. Um, and so, and you see this in Strom Thurmond's life, right? He has a black daughter who he, he manipulates her mother um, and I don't know how young she is when, because I can't remember that part of the autobiography, but he uh, manipulates the mother and, had, and impregnates her. Um, the, the story of the rape of black women is, is an old one. And we need to talk more about, you know, for me, um, what was a, a big fear, which was the sexual power that white men held over black women. Um, for a long time in which we could only like have to politely deny or try and try to extract ourselves very carefully without losing our jobs from. Thank you. So how does um, that idea of, um, how do we reproduce carceral logics into society um, for our students of color? How do they experience that? I mean, so, so, well, carceral logics are in society. I mean, I think, you know, teachers are socialized into them. Right, so my job as an educator has been to disabuse other educators, especially educational leaders of their beliefs in carcerality, right? Um, so, and showing them how that shows up for them, right? So it shows up in, in their classroom management practices, um, what they notice and they don't notice, who they send out and don't send out, um, what, you know, what kinds of opportunities they provide in the classroom or don't. Um, in their discussion, we had class on Thursday night where we were talking about um, restorative justice. Like what are the alternatives to um, removal, um, suspension, exclusion, um, punishment? And we talked about, you know, discipline um, coming from the idea of to disciple or to teach. Um, punishment coming from this idea of penality, right? Um, and what we how we how we teach the behaviors that we want to see in the classroom. And so many of my students can't imagine a world where they don't have some form of suspension and removal. Like they 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 wanted to go to this this conversation of like, well, but how can you do this? It, like, but what's where do you have suspension? And so like what if we put suspension, take suspension off the table for now and we just talk about what we want. Like they're asking the wrong questions, which is what do we want? our kids to, to do and to learn in our classroom and how do we make that happen? And, and so I just think about like when I was teaching, when I had that conversation, I never saw the behaviors that I didn't want. They rarely showed up and they quickly got in line. I remember saying to myself, I want them to treat this classroom like it's a privilege, like it's a space that they wanna go to. Like they're, they'll, they'll um, that they'll do anything to get into and they'll, they'll never miss. And, and, they, and, and also I have to be a particular person to them to create that kind of a space. So I remember when I was first teaching a class um, of students, remember I was telling about the ELD class was the advanced ELD class and the students weren't turning in their homework, right? And so I had to think about like, how do I get them to turn in their homework? Cause there's this, you know, I'm getting 25, 50% of the class to, to turn in their homework and the rest of them are not doing it and so we had this conversation and like what are the rewards what are the benefits to you what are what are what am i going to be to you? how am i going to be to you in terms of like what i give you for homework and so i was very clear with them like i'm not going to give you busy work ever if we finish what we need to finish in class then we don't have homework but my homework is always going to be practice it's going to be an extension of what i've given what we've covered in class it's always going to be something you can do um we're we'll start it in class 
And if you have questions, I'll answer them so you can go home and get some more practice because that'll inform the next class. I need you to do this for me. And so if we do this, I promise this, and here's what I'll give you. And so we have that conversation. Child, do you know I had like 95, 100% homework coming? And they were like, it was so, for me, it was so easy and profound. Like, and, and you know, sometimes students couldn't do their homework. And so they were like ashamed and I didn't want them to be ashamed either. But I think what we're, what a lot of the conflicts we have is because we aren't asking the right questions and we're not having um, conversations about how can we be this to one another? Like it's about relationship. So when people are sending folks to the office, they're asking me to have a relationship that they should be having. When, when um, I mean, and, and when you listen to, to abolitionists talk about, you know, abolition, it's rooted in relationship. Um, and so, and I can't, exp and I, so I teach that to my students and I can't express that enough. Like the relationship, like teaching is rooted and grounded in these like positive, transformative, loving, relationships where you deeply understand someone and seek to help them realize their best selves. So I don't know if that answers your question. I did have a kind of a follow-up question. Thank you for explaining that. Um, for instance, when our students go into stores and they are, somebody gets on them immediately and they're surveilling them while they're walking them around. Would that be an example of carcerality in society? Yeah, I mean, it's surveillance, right? And so there are all these aspects of carcerality. There's, you know, there's the hyper surveillance, there's the punishment, there's the imprisonment, um, there's a, there are all, all these kind of stigmatizing rules and expectations. Um, it has a lot of aspects of it. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly the, it could lead to carcerality, but it's mostly like this, um, you know, depending on who they're following, and usually it's a person of color or someone they don't think has the means to, to purchase this thing, or um, they think, you know, they think very little of. So it could be a person of color, someone who they assume is poor, um, someone who seems out of place. And so that's when you get to the culture of space. Like, who do you think this space is for? Mm -hmm. And if you don't think the space is for them, um, then what do you do when you don't think this space is for them? And so then it becomes, you know, for many students, they they tell us there's research um, that one of our students did at the grad school level, um, a doctoral student a few years ago, they explained that they um, some of the African American students would walk into classrooms and teachers would say to them, you know, are you sure you're in the right classroom? They just walked in the room. You know, they literally walked in the room like every other person before them and then they're asked, are you, are you in the right space? And so why is that? Um, because they don't think black students should be in this space. Um, they think that someone else should be in this space. And the same way at stores when students are, you know, followed around and made to feel uncomfortable. They don't think you should be in the space. You're not who they think of when they think of a customer. Yeah. It's interesting you said that my sister is, she's a purse buyer, so she likes the beauty and the Louis and all of that. And when she goes in sometimes, well, um, if she's browsing, trying to look at a couple of different things, they're usually, if they've known her and she's come in there before, they're fine. But people who don't know her are usually like having an attitude because they got to go get another bag. And this, I want to say last month was the first time I ever heard her say, you know what? I told her, never mind, I'll wait. And in her mind, she said, I'd wait till somebody else is there because I didn't want her to get the sale. And I'm like, but it speaks to the culture of the company. And so for me, I'm not going to wait for another person because the company who should be training and on culture um, needs to do some change, make some changes. And so I was like, I wouldn't give him my money at all. Um, but it just makes me think about how many of my um, acquaint, you know, friends and family members have gone into these places that they don't make Gucci for you. So they don't really care if they hit or miss with you because it's not made for you. And so for me, it's like, well, if it wasn't made for me, then maybe that's why I shouldn't buy it. But I know people like what they like. Um, but just hearing that made me think about, you know, if, it, if the space is not intended for me, it wasn't made for me. So I don't need the products. So I'm a big letter writer. <laughs> if, if you mistreat me, expect to get a letter <laughs> and I'm going to write it all the way to corporate America and I want an apology. Yeah. And so when we were trying to get our bathroom remodeled, actually, let me go forward, backward. We were getting our kitchen remodeled. We still haven't gotten the bathroom remodeled. We were trying to get our, our kitchen remodeled 
there were people, and I said this to my, one of my best friends is a white woman named Mary. And Mary and I talk about the ways that I get treated as a black woman, that she never gets treated as a white woman, right? And, but she's also the first to believe me when I tell her this. And it was really heartening when I would say this to her and, and she was, she's like, yep, that's it. It's the racism right there, right? So white, mostly white, um, uh, because I live in a community that's 0.1% black, so really small percentage of black folk, right? Uh, were, um, we asked folks to come in and give us bids. And there were some folks who were just funky behaving. And so I would just ask them, you need to leave my space. You know, we, I, I'm not going to, I'm not, no, you can't. Because if they come into my home space, disrespectful, as if they're doing me a favor and I'm paying them, I'm not going to pay you to disrespect me. Um, you, you need to leave. And I will also notify the person who owns the business why I'm not going with you because you're be of your behavior. So you might lose your job too. Um, but I'm a big believer in letter writing because I want us as black people and black people in particular and people of color generally to be treated with respect, the respect we deserve. We're human beings, we deserve dignity. I'm not gonna beg you for it. And so how can educators disrupt the daily normalization of white supremacy in their schools? I mean, I think the first thing is that educators need to even be aware of it, right? So one of the reasons why white supremacy shows up is because education is mostly white. <laughs> it's, an, it's a space created for them, right? And it's by them created for them. And we had our black education system, like a, a parallel system, but then they closed our schools, made us go to theirs, and then fired all the black educators. And then as in the case of my mom, they were really nasty throughout her entire education career. Um, and there's, you know, that's well supported in the literature. I didn't make that up. So I think one of the things is that educators need to be aware, keenly aware of the spatial cultures that they are in and are producing in their classroom. So the spatial culture of my classroom was different from my peers, right? Because I intentionally so, because I centered the voices of students of color. And because I, we co-created a space, right? Where they were respected and, and accorded dignity. Um, and, and I think one of the things we have to talk about in education, we don't talk about enough, but particularly in our preparation programs about our beliefs about other people. So, you know, white educators often come to education with no experience with communities of color, having no real friends who are people of color, having learned about us through the media and have all these tropey negative ideas about us, you know? Do you have a tail? I mean, like, you know, my mom and, and, and husband who are boomers can tell you stories about, you know, these beliefs people had about them being part animal and not really being human. Um, and so being completely different, not even the same species. And so you follow that logic out, they treat you like you're less than human as well. So maybe um, a reckoning and recognition of their beliefs about people of color um, and what they've learned about race. Um, so a lot, it's, it's a lot of reflection and unlearning and learning anew. Um, and, and what that looks like is I think we have to center, um, and I, I think G and I both do this in our classrooms, we center the voices uh, and the perspectives, the epistemologies, the experiences of people of color. My readings are so black, I sometimes feel bad for myself. <laughs> it's like, we got black people again this week and this week in black education because they need to, there's, we've been so invisibilized and erased from their understanding um, that, uh, that we need to, Put, put us front and center so that they can learn some things that they wouldn't learn um, from other, uh, that they haven't learned before. So um, for example, they, my students took one of my class, I'm talking about good schools and bad schools, good neighborhoods and bad neighborhoods. And what they're really talking about were black spaces and white spaces, you know? Um, and what they were really, really talking about was segregation, intentional segregation. Um, intentional siphoning of resources away from black and brown spaces and communities toward communities that were white and middle-class and wealthy, you know? 
And so we need to call it what it is. We need to start to, and teaching students how to name things. And initially they're very uncomfortable with naming things or they don't even know how to articulate it. And then over time, uh, and they don't even know the history behind it. Uh, and so there's a lot of that kind of work that we have to do um, to get to what you're talking about. So recognizing white supremacists and inequitable spatial cultures, it's this kind of learning to even recognize when they see whiteness at work. Um, so I, in, pa in the past, I would ask my students to do this kind of qualitative research, right? So they do this deep dive into, you know, inequity at their school that was basically an equity audit. But then when I asked them to, to gather qualitative um, examples um, of that inequity in practice, many students couldn't find it. And so I had to start to teach them, this is how whiteness looks because they would overlook it. They were so unab unable to recognize it. Um, and so we, and so now I think uh, this group of students I have this year are keenly aware um, of how whiteness is at work. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's a growing and learning. It's gonna take them a, a lifetime of that because they've been often conditioned to think that even when they see it, they, they rationalize it. Um, well, it's like this because it's supposed to be, well, of course, you know, um, and they don't see um, it as something that's, uh, that, that creates a two-tiered system that's um, steeped in white supremacy, um, that's steeped in inequity, um, that's, that's, that's wrong. Um, so that's a, a big part of the work that I do with students and just even helping them to see um, share anything you are doing to educate others on spatial culture. So I'm very excited about what I'm going to tell you now. And I hope you'll come because I've been saying all this stuff about carceralty and kind of using that word a lot. Um, and I've been really influenced by the work of Bettina Love, of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, of Angela Davis, um, of Miriam Kaba, um, so many others, right? Clint Smith, um, who are all talking about abolition. I've been listening to podcasts, reading books and articles. I didn't realize that I was always in conversation with them when I was talking about um, ending school resource officers and school, you know, ending school resource officers. I didn't realize that I was part of this larger conversation. I was just like, well, I guess I'm doing this by myself. I didn't realize I was part of abolition already, like, but I was talking about abolition in schools. So I created a video um, in June of this year. Um, hopefully you'll link it to this where I talk about abolition um, in, well, I, I really talk about ending school, school resource officers in school. Right, this is so redundant. Um, I have, you know, of course, written lots of articles about this, but I'm most excited about this project where we're coming together as an entire department um, to talk about abolition. And so we had money. We wrote a grant for a speaker series, and we were funded. In the past, our speaker series, we've just had a couple of pe people talk about a theme, but with my colleague Katie and my colleague. Um, Eric Haas, I, we really were in this deeper conversation about like we of wanting to talk about abolition and wanting to have it be an extended conversation and um, a collaboration with our students. So not us presenting something to y'all, but us really becoming co-conspirators or collaborators um, to define what abolition means for us and what it has to do with educational leadership. So um, December 2nd and the 16th, for about an hour and a half, we are going to sit down and talk about abolition. And I'm so excited to see what you guys say about what abolition means and then like what it means for educational leadership. And then in the spring, we have um, three speakers. Um, so three panels, we've started to contact them all. So we for sure will have freedom of poor Christy, who does a lot of abolition and in, in teaching, right? So, and she's local and she's one of our alum. So we've contacted her and she blew my mind because I have already been doing this a little bit, but I hadn't realized that like, I'm, I'm one of those slow people putting everything together. I told you I came to carcerality late and like, I'm still shaking off things I and unlearning things from before, but like, um, 
maybe two or three years of two or three years ago, I um, a friend of mine invited me to come with them because I I speak Spanish to this um, uh, meeting where they were going to talk with um, the immigrant community in Richmond about um, the abolition of ICE. Well, not really the abolition of ICE, but you know protecting themselves from ICE. And so I went to that panel and I was on the panel and I talked about as an, from the educator perspective and then there are people talking about it from the um, legal perspective. So there were immigration attorneys there. And when we finished, the line was like out the door of all the people who wanted to talk to the immigration attorneys. Nobody wanted to talk to the schools, right? Um, but what I, what I left with was this profound understanding that schools have a responsibility to deal with, um, to be on the front line, school leaders, um, to say to ICE, you will not come into my school. You will not detain my students. Um, this is a place you can't, this is a, you know, a safe space for our students, right? Um, and so we were, it, it hit me that that was, you know, the part of the ways I need, one of the ways I needed to equip my leaders, right? Future leaders to understand the responsibility they have to the undocumented. So we, so I had been thinking about that already. And so Farima, put that together for us. She's like, well, if we're going to talk about abolition, we need to talk with incarcerated people, uh, formerly incarcerated people, rather. I've been listening to this podcast for years about the formerly incarcerated, and it had been changing my mind um, about what I thought um, or what I thought I knew about incarceration, right? Like there are some people, they just need to be incarcerated, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it just blew my mind. I'm trying to think of the name of it. I'll find it for you. Um, but then, so all of that to say, there are these really exciting things that are going on. We're in community with a lot of folks. So from the formerly incarcerated uh, immigration attorneys, um, uh, abolitionists, um, educational leaders, and then our students. And we're going to have these three speaker series in the spring. They're going to be talking about like once we've done our working group work in December, we're going to come and talk with these panelists about okay, so this is what we've been doing. Can you be thought partners with us around um, this work? And I don't know what we're going to produce in the spring, but I'm really excited because I think it could be a powerful set of either tenets, um, it could be uh, an article, it could be a set of workshops, but it'll be something that I think we'll be very proud of. Um, and I'm excited that we conceptualized it and we'll get to produce that for the Bay Area. Yeah, it sounds amazing. I rsvp this morning, so um, I'll be there. Um, and then I was just gonna add- oh, um, I know what I was gonna say to you. The podcast is called Ear Hustle. Ear Hustle. Yeah. So listen to Ear Hustle. It'll change your mind, um, help you understand what the incarcerated are living with. Go ahead. Um, there's a one. There's one called a Hundred Years Podcast. These three brothers. Um, mm -hmm. They, uh, I think, all together they did a hundred years. It was like one did thirty five, something like mm. that. Together they equate to a hundred years. And they've just been sharing their journey, like getting back out and getting acclimated to mm -hmm. society, and then talking too about just the challenges that they face. So. Um, it'd be interesting. I want to. I'm gonna actually share our conversation with them so that they can um, learn about carcerality. And then I was gonna say that was it last year, the year before, when I think the, the federal government sent ICE out and San Francisco mm -hmm. that it was a sanctuary city. Mm -hmm. the program got city funding. We were included in the school districts training around what to do if ICE was to show up. Mm -hmm. And so that's to protect the kids. We don't hand the kid over uh, mm -mm. on the site. And so I, you mentioning that just helped me to remember just that training that I went through and that um, just what our, our, our immigrant families are faced with. Right. Um, you know, being able to look at the other side of that because a lot of people have whatever comments they have about immigration. But, you know, for me, it's like, I don't care where the kids come from. Kids are kids. And so my, even like the ones in the cages, for me, that's that's an issue. And I'm like, if yeah. we do nothing about them, our kids are next. We got to believe, you know, and so we have to like be in solidarity and we have to like continue to fight and advocate for them to be released. So that just kind of brought that up for me. Um, 
it was a know your rights workshop. I didn't, I don't know if I said that very clearly. And then it makes me, you're talking about, we're talking about immigration and detention, right? Um, and what I failed to realize when I was doing that, that uh, know your rights workshop, um, when I talk about immigrants who were there, I saw mostly Latinx immigrants, but we have a disproportionate number of African, um, the, so the African diaspora is implicated in, in um, is involved in detention and immigration as well. And so if there are black people who are like, well, those are the, that's those other people. No, it's our people. It's people who look just like me, it was a different boat stop. Um, but people who are um, African and from, have African ancestry are being ensnared by this as well. Absolutely. I've had a student whose father was, um, I want to say maybe when she was in eighth grade and I watched her go through high school and they used to have to, you know, three times a year go visit and get prepared for that visit. And mm -hmm. the youngest sibling never really met the dad outside of that. And so mm -hmm. just being able to support her and connect her to resources. Um, yes. Yeah, I don't have all the answers, but I know I can connect you to the right organizations that can support you and your mom. And so luckily we were, we were able to connect them with a lot of um, resources that supported, you know, them going to see him as well as just the mom trying to raise three or four kids in the city, you know, on one job. And so, um, yeah, that, that um, it's interesting because we always think of because what they show us on TV, similar to what they do to us, to other people, right? And so you think, of, oh, it's these ones that are selling kids, that are trafficking kids and selling drugs. And I'm like, no, like that's what they want you to see so you don't buy into it. Like it's, it's everyday families just like yours who are in those cages and who are being separated. And they were leaving a country. If anybody walks out of a country for, it takes a month to get somewhere, it must be that bad, right? And so- It has to be. Um, just really trying to educate um, black people around what does it mean for to have solidarity with other groups and right. like we can't fix anybody till we fix ourselves. Well, we haven't done that. So my thing is like I'm working with anybody that wants to take action. And so hearing you um, speak today around abolition and just some of those things, I think um, has just kind of re lit my fire to actually <laughs> start to support my um, especially my Latino sisters um, in LA who are. I'm working on um, close the camps. That's right. So to get back involved in that. That's right. Um, have you taken any action to disrupt carcerality during the pandemic? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm always taking action. It, it may not be these big fancy actions. So um, we have to be really careful because my husband um, has a, a medical condition. So we have to be careful during the pandemic of how much we go out or that sort of thing, but we did as a family um, uh, go out and march. Um, we marched, we've marched uh, once with our, we have a, we're part of um, African-American families in Davis, I think it's called. I probably said it wrong, but anyway, our organization marched um, at a BLM protest, a Black Lives Matter protest, um, where we walked um, in support of Black lives, in support of abolition. Um, in support of ending carcerality. Um, and my kids were really like, wow, you know, uh, because they're little, like my littlest one was six at the time. Um, and I've, uh, I enrolled my son, my, my 13 year old, he was 12 at the time in a class that was a free class that was taught that was about the history of policing so that he would understand why I felt so strongly about it. Um, I did. The, I created the video. I think I told you that. Um, that was during the pandemic. That was in June. I just felt really compelled to just say something. Um, and at the time, I it was just before people were really starting to talk about ending um, where, where all these districts were then starting to make their moves toward ending um, uh, the school re policing in schools. So I, it was just before that. Um, let's see. What else did I do? Um, always my conference presentation. So um, I've done a couple of conferences this year. Um, most recently, um, maybe a, two weeks ago, where I spoke to the school psychologists at my university um, about carcerality. And, you know, I moved from the, the prison camps um, 
uh, to carcerality in school spaces. So just giving them this broad understanding of this, there's this continuum. Um, building networks and relationships with other scholars is the next thing is because I think when we do this work in community, so I have this vision for this really big idea, this that will do it across um, Northern California, that will all be working toward the same goal, right? Of ending carcerality, ending racialized disproportionate, um, racializing disproportionate discipline, um, coming up with humanizing um, and liberating ways of addressing um, the small misbehavior that we see in school. Um, and even the big misbehavior that we see in school, the misbehavior and teaching students what we want and listening to students better. So finding ways to develop networks with others who are doing the same sort of work. Um, we're working on a reading list uh, and resource list for the department. So in support of our work around abolition. So there's been a lot um, that I've been doing and working with others on. Um, and it'll continue to be because it's, you know, this is kind of like an area of um, scholarship that I'm involved in that I didn't realize I was always in conversation with. But um, as I started to read more, I realized that um, ending the school to prison nexus is also part of abolition. That's amazing. You're doing so many amazing things. How do you advocate for critical space making um, for students of color? So that was something I should have asked you, like, what do you mean by critical space making so that we're on the same page? So I would say um, being thinking critically about the spaces that our students of color use so that it does not create the conditions that carcerality does. I mean, I think I, so I kind of talked about this a little bit earlier when I say that in the classes that I'm in, just like centering the history, right, of, of this nation, right? So starting with the end of the, um, of the Civil War and kind of explaining how we created these two Americas um, so that our students can understand that it's not the culture or the lack of anything um, 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 be, that Black people and people of color have, but rather it's intentional decisions to um, foreclose Black people and people of color from certain kinds of, you know, and high status opportunities that have created these kind of dual tracks in America, right? Um, so I think that's the biggest way that I do that work. Um, and having conversations um, about really reflective conversations, kind of helping our students to reflect on, on their own positionality and their own experiences and how they got there, how they got to believe what they believe. Um, we've had some incredible uh, poetry, um, art, uh, conversations, uh, reflections, um, where students really come to, to recognize that this is, this is intentional. Um, and, and not some kind of cultural thing that, that is the responsibility or fault of Black people. And if they, I think that's one of the biggest things that um, white students, white educators need to know. And then critical sense making. So once they can recognize that, then they can create in their own classrooms these spaces for students, right? So. Um, they can then start to think about what, how can I make my classroom culturally relevant? How can I think about culturally relevant, culturally responsive, culturally humble? Um, there's all, there are all these ways that we can start to look at their, our classrooms, spaces that are liberatory, um, loving, um, but they first have to kind of clean, clean their hearts. I don't know if there's any better way for that, for me to say that. Because okay. um, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of the problem in education is not the babies. It's the educators' beliefs about the babies and attitudes toward the babies and their families. Yeah. Like, and if you wanna fight me about it, I can produce the research. I've written the research that shows that. It's really their beliefs and their practices towards students. Yeah. So, so that's I that. I, I, I'm, I totally can agree with what you're saying because I feel like, it's, educator is it's a calling mm -hmm. and 
everybody is not called to do that work. And if you don't like you, <laughs> you should not be teaching, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first kind of sign for me is if people say that, like, so why are you in this work? Um, and so I want to say thank you. That you've given me a lot to reflect and process, which I'm going to have to go back and probably watch this video two or three times. But <laughs> I do want to um, pull up a couple of the pearls that I heard you say in our conversation. And so mm -hmm. what stood out for me was teaching is rooted and grounded in transformative relationships. Um, I definitely feel like that has been the foundation of my, my education career, has always been to connect with the young people on a, a deep level, and then you can move into teaching. So I definitely agree with that. Um, educators need to be keenly aware of the spatial culture in their classrooms. So I like that you talked about most of the time people aren't aware. They haven't well. even about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I do think about Dr. G's class because I haven't taken the class with you yet, but the way he sets up and he grounds, um, grounds us and um, pays homage to the, um, the elders and all of those things and just gives us space to, it, it, he creates this radical, radical healing space, mm -hmm. but then you're also there to learn. So it, it, it and it's like, the, it's learning and teaching. Mm -hmm. He doesn't stand there as I'm the guru and I know it all but he guides and frames it. And as we bring things up, it just, oh, it's, it's a powerful space to be in. So wow. that made me think about that. Um, all educators need to need to have, um, participate in anti-bias training. So unlearning to learn, that is huge to me. I think a lot yeah. of people on the surface, they feel like, oh, no, I don't have those issues. But as you dig and you talk, or if you yeah. have a conversation long enough, things, you know, microaggressions come out, different things happen. And so it's like, okay, we all, and so frame it as we all need to, because I know I bring my own biases to yes, setting. Yes, me too. Um, really take an opportunity to unlearn so that we can learn. And then just one more that I want to highlight. There's so many more, so much more here, but center the voices of people of color. I like that you are doing that and that um, you're encouraging others to do that because we have been silenced. Um, for many years, uh, many of us still don't believe we have voices. Um, this space was created because I wanted to create a space where the average everyday person could come and make critical sense about life. Mm -hmm. Many of us were never invited to a table to talk about the challenges we face, never have those conversations. And so um, I started off with a lot of people that I know were comfortable, but I'm really gonna move toward more young people voices in the spaces, as well as people who just have never had the opportunity to make critical sense. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the highlights I had. I really, this was a really great conversation. Like I said, I'll probably take the rest of the week to reflect. Um, but if there's one last piece of advice, tip, or just something you would like to share with the viewers, the last voice they hear will be yours. Oh, that's a big one. Um... Well, first, thank you. I mean, you, you're so easy to talk to, right? Thank you for creating this space. And I am thinking about what you just said about youth voice. Um, I think that's the next frontier. I had a panel recently um, where about LGBTQ, the LGBTQ community. And we had a, a member of the youth community on the panel and it was so rich because um, we often talk about youth, but we don't often have them talking about their experiences. So I'm actually taking that away from you, to be honest. I'm glad because we need more of that. So thank you again, Dr. Gray. And we look forward to, this, to watching your video, which I will connect um, in, the info, in the description and make sure that I share that out. Thank you.